think the, the debt situation in Africa, it's, it's something that we have to understand the context. There's been a, quite a deluge of factors that have contributed to that. Of course, it's the tapering effect of the COVID-19 pandemic, for which Africa still needs about $540 billion to just recover from that. Then you have the situation of climate change uh, that is impacting Africa quite negatively. The continent loses about uh, 7 to $15 billion a year just to climate change. So you can imagine the impact that that is having. And add on top of that, the situation with the geopolitical risk that, uh, of the war between uh, Russia and, and Ukraine. So it's driven up energy prices and also driven up commodity prices. So it's like when it rains, there's a deluge of that. And so many of the countries are finding it very, very difficult in this situation. Currencies have actually depreciated. Interest rates have gone up a lot, so the cost of servicing debt has also gone up significantly for many of the countries. And therefore, you have um, a situation where Africa today you know, has about roughly $1.3 trillion into that debt stock that Africa has. And, and so the key to really dealing with this as follows. First and foremost is to create more fiscal space for the countries. You know, the African Development Bank does quite a lot of counter-cyclical financial support to many of the countries to expand their fiscal space uh, during the COVID-19. Uh, for example, we set up a facility of up to uh, $10 billion to provide fiscal space for the countries uh, in responding to the uh, issue of the uh, food, 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 the food crisis. Uh, we put up uh, $1.5 billion uh, to support countries to produce more food. Uh, but also, there has to be a lot more work in building capacities to manage that. So the, the bank has a debt uh, management action plan for Africa in which we uh, support a lot of public financial management uh, in debt. The third area, of course, is we, as part of the global financial architecture, have worked very hard to um, do the G20 common framework in which the debt obligations between the private sector that you mentioned and the, uh, and the um, uh, private creditors and, uh, and the bilateral creditors uh, are, are dealt with. And so the creditor committees have concluded that for, for Chad, they've concluded that for Zambia, and really looking at uh, Ghana and, and, and other uh, 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 countries, just, just in Africa, quite a number of them. And finally is um, what we are doing in terms of the special drawing rights. Because you know, with special drawing rights, if you have special drawing rights of $250 billion, uh, allocated to multilateral development banks, which I have been arguing for, uh, you can raise a trillion dollars uh, to continue to lend uh, low interest, long term money for many of these countries. So these are some of the things that we are doing, but I was in Paris uh, just three weeks ago uh, for the global um, summit on the new financial partners, I mean, new financial architecture uh, for Africa and um, for the world, but in case of Africa, I said, we need in Africa to avoid having uh, natural resource back loans. Today, $60 billion of Africa's debt are back, which is natural resources, metals, minerals, gas, oil, and so on. And those things are not transparently done. Um, cost Africa a lot of money. So these are the things that we are trying to do. At the end of the day, though, we also have to help African countries to be able to access capital markets uh, at low uh, interest rate. And so we provide a lot of uh, partial credit guarantees to many of the countries being able to do that. A good example, we helped uh, Egypt uh, to launch a $500 million panda bond on the Chinese market, which is the first time that that has ever happened by any African country. We also helped, uh, for example, Benin uh, to launch a 400 million euro I mean, uh, uh, debt issuance on the, on the euro bond market. You know, the, the young people um, are the best assets that Africa has. Uh, but we've got a third of them that are unemployed, a third of them that are, yeah, that are underemployed, and a third of them that are simply mad with governments. And so when I see young people uh, go to take rickety boats and they go to um, the Mediterranean, many of them die there. You know, it really makes me extremely sad because the future of Africa's youth, theming youth, over 464 million people, less than the age of 30, their future does not lie in Europe. It doesn't lie in the United States. It, it doesn't lie. Country. It lies in their countries. But their countries have to grow well, equitably, and invest in them. You know, um, as I said during my lecture, you know, I, I go around Africa and I hear a lot of things about youth empowerment programs. Yes. But they are very, they're just facades. You know, they don't really, the youth don't need that kind of empowerment. 
they need investment in their skills, in their capacity, and finance. Because you may have education, you may have skills, you may have capacities. If you don't have access to finance, it's dead. And that's why the African Development Bank is doing three, we're doing three things to support the youth in Africa. First, take agriculture. We have a program called Enable Youth in Agriculture to get young people to understand agriculture as a business. And we're doing it in more than 25 countries already. And we've invested um, a lot of money in this to train them, to give them access to finance and all that. The second one is um, on the digital. Um, we have something called Coding for Employment, in which we are setting up, we are setting up 130 coding centers in Africa. Yeah, where we can upskill uh, uh, the young people with their skills in uh, um, computer coding because coding is the new currency. It uh, is. Uh, uh, it, is, that, is there an age range for that? No, no. So a three-year-old can. No, not a three-year-old for sure. <laughs> no, no. But a young person, anything between the age of 15 and oh. on the age and above, and and, and of course, uh, I'll say about 35. Uh, it's what we focus on. We work together with um, uh, Microsoft on that. We work together. Uh, with MasterCard Foundation on that. And in fact, we have a big program also that we are supporting in Nigeria. The third thing we are doing, which is the most strategic for me, is establishing youth entrepreneurship investment banks. And these are new financial institutions that will support the businesses of young people, help us to create youth-based wealth in Africa. When a young person goes to a bank, what do they ask them? Go bring your collateral, your house. You don't have a house, you're a young person. You only have ideas. They're just starting. Exactly. But we must have faith and confidence in our young people and put capital at risk for them, right? And create youth-based wealth in Nigeria and across Africa. And that's why we are setting up, we're working to establish these youth entrepreneurship investment banks uh, together with the MasterCard Foundation uh, on this. And what they will do is they will deploy different type of instruments to support the businesses of young people in the life cycle of their businesses. So in the early phase of it, they'll give them technical support, business development services. As they grow, they will deploy for them debt instruments and also equity instruments. So it's like, as their business grows, so from stage to stage supports them. life cycle financing for them, because that's not just the future of Africa, that's the present of Africa, and we must boost their wealth. Well, the, the youth entrepreneurship investment banks are going to be first rate financial institutions managed by top and bankers, they are going to be largely young people, you know, who understand the business of young people. It's very good governance structure. They will help them to be able to develop their business plans, to make sure they are bankable business plans. They will de-risk those business plans. And of course, they will monitor and evaluate the growth of those businesses. And of course, even those that are going to run these banks are going to be incentivized based on their ability to grow these businesses over time. So everybody wins. Everybody wins, but it's something we have to do structurally because I think a lot of the youth empowerment programs, unfortunately, are not sustainable, they are not scalable, they are not dealing with systemic issues. And so these youth entrepreneurship investment banks will be the biggest thing to happen for young people uh, on this continent. Okay, so you can partner then with companies that are interested in teaching young people how to scale their business as well? Absolutely. We will, we, will, we will partner up with those that want to teach them how to develop businesses. The, you know, and we will look at different types of sectors. We will look at uh, the digital industry. We will look at the uh, creative industries. We will look at agriculture. We will look at all kind of small businesses as well. Well, if you are in business, the first thing you should do in Nigeria is read Business Day. Uh, business Day is a professional uh, newspaper. Um, it is very, very insightful in looking at business trends and looking at investment trends, and, and looking at performance of you know, very, the stock, stock, stock market and of, of different uh, industries. And so I think that if you, when I look at Business Day, um, I say this is what a business person needs to look at every single day to know what's happening, where to invest, and how to invest. So I encourage folks to read it every single day. I go on the internet and read it um, most of the time. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you.